In this video, I'm going to go over optimization and performance in Substrate along with the Substrate settings. So I'm going to start off by going up here to Edit, Project Settings. And if you search Substrate, this is where you can find the Substrate settings for your project. And you can enable Substrate materials here. And the very first thing we're going to look at is the Substrate G-Buffer format. So the Substrate G-Buffer format has two options. It has the blendable G-Buffer and the adaptive G-Buffer. The blendable G-Buffer, it's a more fixed way, a more compact way of blending material responses. And it's a much more limited representation of your materials. So if you have like a clear coat or multiple materials blended together, like you have a skin with wetness on top and then dirt on top of that, the blendable G buffer is going to do that layering in a more approximated way. And you're going to lose detail and not have proper layering and interaction between those different layers. But the adaptive G buffer allows for much more complexity. The adaptive G buffer is going to be used more for high quality materials and accurate layering, but the cost of it is going to be higher per pixel memory usage and slower performance but it gives you a much more correct response to layering materials or having more complex materials. If I hover over this, it says the blendable G buffer only allows you to have one closure and 20 bytes per pixel maximum. So what is a closure? That's the next thing that's really important to understand uh, with substrate because the very, Next option here, if you have the adaptive G buffer enabled, is you can set the closure per pixel limit. If you're on the blendable G buffer, there's none of those options because the blendable G buffer will limit you to one closure and 20 bytes per pixel. But the adaptive G buffer allows you to set how many closures are your limit and how many bytes per pixel are your limit. Now, a closure is what you could think of as a material response or as like a layer. So if you were to think about substrate and creating substrate material, creating one material, like a substrate slab, the result of that slab would be like a closure. So if you had two materials blended, like you had a substrate slab and then on top of it, you had another substrate slab or a clear coat layer and you had that clear coat on top of the other substrate slab, that would be two closures two different material responses blended with each other. So that material would end up having two closures. So by having the blendable G buffer, it kind of combines everything into one material by, by blending parameters. Whereas having the adaptive G buffer, things are layered as actual separate materials layered on top of each other. And the reaction between those two layers or two different materials is more accurate. Now, the more complex your materials are, the more bytes per pixel they're going to use. And that goes for also if you have more closures or more material responses blended, you're going to end up with a material that has more bytes per pixel consumed. So this byte per pixel is kind of the complexity limit of your materials. And if substrate reaches that limit, it will start to simplify that material automatically or as needed. So that's kind of what we're setting here, our closure per pixel limit here and our byte per pixel limit here is going to limit our project. So if our closure limit is exceeded, what Substrate might do is start to, instead of properly evaluating those different uh, materials blended on top of each other, it will force some simplification where everything is kind of combined into a single closure. Very similar to how the blendable G buffer works or starting to simplify it so it doesn't go beyond that limit. So it'll kind of automatically start to apply um, simplification if this limit is exceeded and causing performance issues. Now, what about the bytes per pixel limit? Same kind of thing. So if your material goes over this set number of bytes per pixel, it will start to simplify the material. So generally, what should you set these to? What should you set your closure amount to, your bytes per pixel uh, limit to? If you leave these at the default, substrate can get pretty heavy. So 
that's probably where a lot of people are seeing performance issues. First of all, not knowing how to properly utilize substrate, and then also setting these settings to, to very high values. Generally, if you wanted something a little bit more performant, I would say limit the closures to two to four, and maybe the bytes per pixel uh, 20 to, to 40 or something. If you're going for a really high quality uh, project where performance isn't really an, an issue, you're, you're aiming for very accurate and very high quality and complex layered materials, maybe you'd set your closure limit to four to eight and your bytes per pixel to 60 to 120 or somewhere in that range. So you can change these as needed, but the defaults are kind of leaning a little bit more demanding uh, to some extent, like setting this to 80. You have to make a pretty complex material uh, to reach 80 bytes per pixel. Now, if you want to evaluate your materials and substrate, there's a good mode here you can go to where it says lit here in your viewport. You can go to the substrate tab and turn on material properties and you get this axis that you can hover over your materials or different parts of your materials and it'll read out a lot of useful information to you. So I can hover over a material and it will tell me what does that material have? Does it have scattering? Does it have anisotropy? What's its roughness? What's its fuzz amount set to? And it also shows you memory transactions as well. So it gives you a good way of just evaluating different materials and what their settings are really easily in the viewport. So that's really a useful tool, especially when having more complex uh, materials. Now, some other modes that are also very useful from evaluating performance is going here to material drop down under substrate or like this little drop down here instead of material properties there's material count and this will allow you to view how many bsdfs are on your material so if you're blending multiple slabs that's multiple bsdfs or bi-directional scattering distribution functions and you could just think of those as one kind of material slab. And the more of those materials that you blend together, the higher this count goes, the more colored it will become. Right now, all these are fairly simple, so you don't really see any of these other brighter colors. But it can give you a good overview of a complex scene to see what materials might be a lot more demanding and having many materials layered together. Now, another useful mode is going to the one below material count, which is material bytes count, that will tell you how many bytes per pixel uh, the material is utilizing. And you can see that this material is a lot brighter, so it's using more bytes per pixel. You can see kind of like a legend up here for how many bytes or what color. So I'm kind of sitting in this range of, of probably 32 to 64, somewhere in that range. It's probably more around somewhere in that, that range there, but it's a lot brighter here. And if I were to look at that material uh, in my material editor, which I'm just gonna open up here really quickly, this is another thing that's very useful to take a look at, is you can see in your material editor exactly how many bytes per pixel that material is. And if you don't see the substrate tab down here, you can go to window and turn it on and it's extremely useful because it tells you so much detail about that material it tells you the per pixel byte count what your budget is what that material is consuming how many closures that material has and what your budget is and what features are enabled for this material i'm utilizing glints so glints are a feature that it's utilizing and that feature would not be supported if my material was much lower bytes per pixel or if it was more simplified. So if you were using something like, say, not the adaptive G-buffer, but the blendable G-buffer substrate, that would limit your bytes per pixel to 20. And if that were, the, were to be the, the case here, if I turn on this temporary preview here, full simplification, and limit my material to 20 bytes per pixel, um, I'm going to lose that glint effect. So certain effects, certain features 
will be supported with the adaptive G buffer and not with the blendable G buffer because the blendable G buffer forces a much more simplified material. So keep that in mind. If you're using glints or something and then you switch to the blendable G buffer and you wonder why it's gone, that's why. It's limiting the bytes per pixel. It's limiting your material to be more simplified and you're going to lose some of those advanced features. And one final thing we can look at here is the last mode here. If I go down to substrate info, it gives you a lot of great info about your overall scene. What's your maximum bytes per pixel? and what's the current maximum bytes per pixel in your current view and what your budget is. And it just gives you a lot of good uh, overall stats of your scene. So that can also be very useful uh, when troubleshooting performance issues. And then finally, how to use Substrate. So Substrate provides a lot of flexibility, a lot of ways to accurately layer surfaces, but don't overuse it. Don't be wasteful with it. And I think that's what's really important with Substrate is just because you can blend things really nicely and really accurately, don't overcomplicate materials when you don't need to. Generally, try to keep all your materials to just one slab or just one single material and don't blend additional things on top. Like if you need a nice secondary highlight on your material, don't blend a clear coat on top of it. Just use a secondary uh, spec highlight, and that's going to be a little bit more performant. So you want to be still clever with how you approach your materials and utilize blending multiple, multiple materials together where it really matters. Like if you have a character that needs to look really, really realistic, then sure, blend sweat on top of their skin. Use it for the hero assets, but don't squander it on things that don't really need it, like props or assets that are, are not as important. And that's a key to keeping your performance with Substrate. Now, one last thing I also want to go over that I want to make sure everybody knows about is if you are dealing with multiple software packages, like if you're doing a lot of your material creation in Substance Designer or Substance Painter or Mari or other painting softwares, and you notice you get your material looking a certain way in those programs, and then you bring it into Unreal and it looks totally different. Or you have to go adjust some of your properties. Maybe you have to adjust um, some of your settings, some of your diffuse color, some of your uh, parameters on your material. There's a way to get around that. And there's something that's being developed uh, called Open PBR. And the open PBR standard is kind of like an open source shading material model that's been designed to make materials consistent across different 3D tools and renders. So this is something that I believe is developed by Adobe and Autodesk in collaboration under the Academy Software Foundation. And the idea is to keep your materials looking the same in Unreal as they looked in Substance Painter or Substance Designer or some other software that you're authoring them in. And there is this open PBR uh, material model available in both Substrate and in Unreal 5.7 without Substrate. You can find these uh, materials by just right clicking in here and searching open PBR. Now, I wouldn't use this for games because performance is not what this is aimed for. It's aimed for consistency from one software to another. So it's not the best performance but it gives you a reliable way to keep your look from one software package to another. So they have this for Substrate, and they also have it for just plain old um, Unreal without Substrate. But if you look here, there's MF Substrate, Open PBR, Opaque and Translucent. And if you create this, it gives you a really good material that you can use. I can plug this into the, the front material here. And if you're someone who's used to Blender Cycles, or uh, Arnold, or V-Ray, or other renders like RenderMan. This is going to give you a great Uber shader that has all those settings that you're used to. So it has everything. It has base color, it has specular, it has transmission, subsurface coat, fuzz, emission, thin film, everything. All built in one mega Uber material. So you can use this. And if you're wondering how this is built, you can actually go inside of it and see how they've layered 
their substrate slabs together to make this mega material as well. So it has a coat material and everything built in. So if you're using this, you don't have to add additional vertical or horizontal blends for the most part. Like you can, but it'll get very heavy, but generally it has what you need kind of built into it. It already has coat materials built into it. It already has kind of everything you need for a good complex material built into it. So generally you don't have to do additional blends and things on this, but you could, but it's a great kind of mega material for if you're someone used to shading in V-Ray, RenderMan, Arnold, and you're moving to Unreal, you're doing cinematic projects, you want that high quality materials and all those controls that you're used to, this is not a bad thing to use. If you enjoyed this video or you learned something new, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're part of the Patreon, which you can find a link to down in the description below, you'll also get the PDF for this video going over all those steps we've gone over in a little bit more detail.